Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance. Straight ahead on Folks, meet Charles Hutchinson, a self-taught Louisiana artist who specializes in lifelike sculptures. We'll also explore the many sides of his talent. Also in today's program, those who knew and loved the late Lenora Lafayette share their memories of this Louisiana native who made history as one of the first American blacks to sing at a major opera house, all on a special edition of Folks. Hello everyone, I'm Sonia Massengale. Welcome to a special edition of Folks. We decided to break from our usual lineup of issues to profile two black Louisianians whose contributions to the worlds of music and art have helped to improve the quality of life for many people. Let's get started. To those who collect duck decoys and wildlife carvings, the name Hutchinson means artistic and scientific excellence. For more than three decades, New Orleans native Charles Hutchinson has been sharpening what was thought of as a craft to a fine art. Recently, Hutchinson made wood carving history when one of his works sold for $24,000. Charles Hutchinson's art has come to worldwide attention, yet many in Louisiana don't know his name. We'd like to introduce him to you now, a living Louisiana legend who is carving his niche in history. Charles Hutchinson grew up a child of both town and country. Living in Covington, Louisiana in the summers gave him a love of all creatures and respect for the balance of nature. His formal education in the city of New Orleans instilled a love for the arts and humanities. Hutchinson's first experience with carving wild fowl began by creating his own duck decoys for hunting. He was an adult before he realized that carving duck decoys was considered an art. When the 30s and 40s come, even before, uh, I would say about the 40s and 50s, they begin to make the decoys in plastic. Now all these men who carved, there was no way that they could keep up with these machines. It was popping them out, you know, and the prices they were getting from was, was real cheap, you know. And they were good to hunt over. They were light. They had everything that you needed to hunt. So what happened, the, the old men quit carving. And then the art form began to die. And some people realized that this was a dying art form and they begin to collect the decoys. So they become very valuable, and people begin to collect them and all, and then this is where Charles Frank, Charles W. Frank, he began to record these old men, see. And uh, he wrote two books about the Louisiana decoy carvers, and in his first book, he heard about me, and he came over and he spoke to me. And I became an intercessor for him, brought him to all the old black carvers and people, and he interviewed them. And we went to the Cajuns and all over. You know, everybody that carved decoys, we went there and recorded. And uh, this is how I met Charles Frank. Now, Charles Frank is, uh, he was a businessman here, and uh, he introduced me to decorative carving. You know, this is where they did all the, the birds in detail and everything, in fine detail. Even though I was painting a lot of detail on my decoys, I hadn't used a burning tool or anything like that. So he gave me my first burning tool, and he introduced me to decorative carving. And then I was off to the races then when I got that, you know. And uh, then we formed the Guild, the Louisiana Wildfire Carvers and, and Collectors Guild, which is still functioning. And there was a renaissance. People begin, all these old men begin, they, they, their decoys were sought after. And it was wonderful to see these old men starting to carve again, and, you know, they had a, a purpose again. They weren't just sitting on the front porches waiting for time to go, you know. 
Each of Hutchinson's intricate sculptures begins with a seasoned piece of Tupelo gum, a wood handpicked by himself and family members from Louisiana bayous. His attention to detail is meticulous. This Lady Amherst pheasant is a perfect example of his work. Each feather is painstakingly carved, painted, and fitted individually by hand. The techniques Hutchinson employs are uniquely his own, since he has had almost no formal art training. I went to one of the leading universities here, and uh, I told him that I wanted to paint. But I always was interested in realistic art, because that was an avocation with me. In my youth, I wanted to, to, to be able to paint like Audubon, <laughs> you know, because I liked wildlife. So I went there to this place, this prestigious school, you know, and uh, they told me that what I was trying to do could be done with a camera. I told him, but I wasn't a camera. I wanted to paint realistically. But the people there weren't into realistic work, you know. So they kept with the, trying to bend me to their way. So what I did, I came home, and my kids were very small, and like three and five. And I gave them a canvas to, to just smear up. And they got on the floor, and they went to work with the canvas, you know, and they were painting it. I had newspaper all on the floor. So my wife got tired of that, and she said, now that's enough, let's, let's clean up this mess. So she put them in the tub, because they had as much paint on them as they had on the canvas, you know, they had a ball. And I signed the canvas, and I brought it to my next class, and I gave it to the teacher. And she said, oh, you finally arrived. She said, oh, it's beautiful, you know. And before I could tell her what had happened, she went to the head of the class with it, and she was telling everybody about, you know, the wonderful job I did in showing it to them and all. Uh, when she gave it back to me, I thanked her, and that was the end of my formal education. <laughs> you know? But realistic art now is coming into its own again. You know, it had never really waned, but uh, certain schools just didn't go for it. But it's some, I call it the people's art, <clears throat> because you can never hang a realistic painting upside down and don't know it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So I see in a lot of the shows they go, they have to write top on the canvas so you'll know how to hang it, but you don't have that problem when you do realistic work, you know. The making of Hutchinson's sculptures is slow and deliberate. One bird can take months to complete. To protect his artistic integrity, he has turned down numerous offers for the commercial production of his work. Before he begins to sketch an idea, he spends hours and sometimes weeks researching his subjects. I do not use mounts. I use mounts only for reference for color, but not for form and shape and attitude and all that. I try to get that from the real bird, or the live bird. Because if you want to, uh, if you copy, I've seen too many artists make mistakes copying a mount, and it's a dead looking bird. You have to have that vitality, that life, and that comes from freedom of lines and freedom of paint, and knowing your subject intimately. You have to really study them, you know, so that you can portray them in a manner that looks real and gives you the life. Because you're trying more than just a visual image, you're trying to give the essence of the spirit of the thing. When we try to use birds, we're not working with things like the higher animals that can give you facial expressions, you know, even a dog can crowd and show his fangs and everything. But with a bird, all you have is beak and eyes, and of course, bristling, he can riff and roll his feathers. So most of it is body language, you know. So you have to give him the attitudes. And this has to be out of, when you get ready to do a subject, you pick out what you want to do. Then you have to pick out the moment that you would make it, you think it would be the, the prettiest or give you the, the best view at that moment, you know. And you take that microsecond and you draw him in that attitude. And then I like to make thumbnail sketches and then I go from that to developing my, my uh, piece. Something may catch my interest. For instance, the pheasants. I was doing all, the, all our birds, the local birds and everything, you know, and uh, I was looking at the magnificent color of these birds and everything, you know. So that interests me, and then the interest began to grow. And then I thought about, well, why not do a series of pheasants? You know, no one had done it, you know, that I know of, a series of them. So that was it. I was off to the races on that, you know. And uh, it's just like that with anything. You begin to build an interest in something, and then when you focus on it, all of these things are so beautiful that once you start focusing on it, then you can find a reason to want to do it because it's there, it's there all the time, you know. Because his sculptures have received so much attention, there's another side of Hutchinson's art that many casual observers miss. He is also a painter. 
the same amount of meticulous detail that goes into his sculptures is apparent in his paintings of wildlife. Observers often remark that his Intense concern for the environment as a whole. Many of us walk by and the birds fly by, but we never really see it. You know, they're flying jewels, they're flying flowers, they're, you know, they're, they're beauty. They're, they're, there's something that is part of us, but we're not very kind to them. You know, we, uh, what we're doing to the environment is really bad. And I can cry when I, when I see what's happening. I remember as a boy when I used to go in the marshes and the swamps and everything. It was beautiful. I'm talking about maybe 50 years ago, you know, and uh, it was beautiful. You know, a lot of the land I seen, I could just look at this acres of marsh that was green, and then they came with the pipeline canals, and then they began to cut the canals, and after a while I began to see this acres and acres of marsh dying, going away, you know, and that was sad. That's a sad thing to see. Some of Hutchinson's sculptures have sold for upwards of $20,000, but money is not his main motivation for his art. It is his constant search for new challenges and an unending quest for perfection. It isn't a glamorous job. You sit down there many hours doing this tedious work, but if you can keep this image in your mind as to what it's going to be, it's worth that time. But I spent many hours alone just cutting on this wood and all. And people would say, why does he do it? But in the end, when it's done, I feel it was worth it when I look at the creation when it's complete. You always strive for excellence. You're trying to make the thing, you're striving for perfection, which we can't reach because we are imperfect, you know. But the quest for perfection will really make you push. It will really make you improve and grow. So long as we seek perfection, well, this is great but we know we'll never reach it. So when the piece is done, I look at it and say, now where did I fall, fall short? Because the image I have in my mind, like I say, the image is blurred from the mind to the hand. You know, we never quite can make what this beautiful image we have in our brain because we have almost perfect imagery in our brain. But by the time it gets to the finished stage, we can see that things are wrong. So I look for my faults. Because through finding my faults, I can grow. And I hope to God I never get to the point where I make something and never see anything wrong with it. Because then I'm finished. Hutchinson has made wood carving into sort of a family affair. Many of the beautiful pieces seen today were created with the assistance of his son Eric, now also an artist, and Hutchinson's brothers are also sought after wood carvers as well. The next portion of our program introduces us to the late Lenore Lafayette, 
a Baton Rouge native who made history as one of the first black American opera singers to sing a leading role at a major opera house. In 1953, two years before Marian Anderson made her historic debut at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, Lenore Lafayette became the first black to sing at Covent Garden in London. Like so many American musicians then and now, Lafayette had to leave America to overcome the staggering racism that opposed her career. Sadly, most Americans never had an opportunity to hear her sing. Here, family members and a friend give us a glimpse of the hometown girl who made good in Europe. Fellow opera singers call her La Lafayette, the pioneer of black opera singers, and the press called her Cinderella. Her big break into the mainstream of European opera came in 1953, when Lenore Lafayette, a native of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, then living in Switzerland, became the first black singer to perform at Covent Garden in London. George Weaver, an opera scholar and personal friend, tells of his first acquaintance with La Lafayette. Well, when I was an adolescent, I guess I wanted to be an opera singer. And one day, I went with my parents down to the house of the new veterinarian in Tallulah. And I was sitting in the car and just singing to myself some fragment of an operatic aria. And Dr. L.A. Anthony's wife came out on her front porch and she said, I have a cousin who is an opera singer. And I looked at her and I thought, somebody from Tallulah has a cousin who's an opera singer. And I said, well, tell me about that. And she said, well, my cousin is named Lenora Lafayette. Lenora was a very happy child. She loved to sing and dance. And she did a lot of singing in the different churches and schools. And she sang mostly uh, duets at first with her sister, and then she, she decided to branch out on her own. She became very interested in singing when she took music under Mr. Carter at McKinley, and that was the start of her interest in operatic singing. I recall her singing for a graduation program once the Italian street song. And I think that must have been the thing that really decided for her, that she loved that kind of music. I remember when Lenora and I used to go from church to church singing duets together. And these were happy times for us. I wish I could recall everything that we did, but uh, somehow it has just left me. But uh, we would sing and we would get so many comments about our singing that uh, many of the churches would have us to perform Sunday afternoons for them. Her personality never changed from the time she was a child until she grew up to be an adult. Uh, she was always the same kind of person all of the time. and. We, I tell you what, we never did uh, try to overlook anybody. We always talked to everybody. And uh, I think this is why the community loved us so. She was a quite handsome woman. She had large features, which always make for a good appearance on the stage. There was a dignity about her movements. Her speech was quite precise. Her voice was beautifully modulated and she had a warmth that was just very outreaching. Uh, I always felt at ease and quite comfortable with her. And I remember once when I was visiting in her home, she introduced me to her parents and was so loving in her words towards them. Although a pioneer in opera in Europe, Lafayette never received the opportunity to become an operatic force in her native America. I think it was because of the uh, racial issue, really. You couldn't do anything unless you were with certain people, and 
uh, this is this was the first handicap pier, and of course when she left uh, the United States and went to Europe, uh, she was recognized more freely as uh, to whom she was, not as uh, because of her color. She just happened to have been born in an unfortunate time before the barriers were dropped for black singers, and other black singers had the same kind of problem. We had a token group that made it during this time, but the average black, and especially in the opera world, had the same kind of problem that she had. All of them had to go to Europe to get known. Some were accepted back, and some really never made it back. One of the things that I think was troublesome to her was she was engaged to sing Aida, an Ethiopian princess, and Madame Butterfly, a Japanese, as the only two operas that she would ever sing on stage. She sang them over and over and over, and I'm sure judging from the record of the Butterfly duet with great artistry, and certainly from that Verdi performance I heard, her Aida must have been fantastic. She told me also that in 1952 or 53, she received an invitation from the San Francisco Opera to sing Michaela in Carmen. She lived in, at that point in Europe. And she looked at me with a rather sad expression on her face, and she said, I didn't have enough money to book passage to San Francisco. And I think that's the reason that Lenora Lafayette never had a major career in the United States. You see, Marian Anderson was the first black to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, and that occurred in 1955. It made headlines all over the world. And I think if Lenora Lafayette had been engaged to sing at the San Francisco Opera, that the publicity inherent in such an appearance would have gained for her other bookings across this country. Those who remember Lafayette say that her lyric soprano voice was technically superb, but it was her flair for emotion and drama that made her performances special. It was wonderful. I always knew that she would make it. There are a lot of persons in our family who sing, but she had more than just the singing voice. She had the push and the determination, and she had the enthusiasm for the work that she wanted to do. Some of the others could sing, but they didn't have the other to go along with it. It was really marvelous to sit there and hear her sing. And some of the songs that um, she would sing would just uh, make your heart vibrate because mm -hmm. she put so much feeling into them. Uh, her stage presence, uh, I think, added to uh, the song. And uh, this made the audience take note of what she was saying and uh, the way she did it. Her pronunciation was sort of superb to me. And maybe I'm bragging just a little bit. She was very proud to be black, and she was very proud to be from Louisiana, and she let people know wherever she would go that she was a, a Louisianian, she was from Baton Rouge, and most people had not heard of it. They wanted to tag New Orleans on to her, but she would get them straight and know it is Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, she loved Louisiana. I'm only sorry that she did not live long enough to be really, to become known in Louisiana as she should have been. Lenore Lafayette died an untimely death of cancer in 1975. Those who knew and loved her still mourn the loss of her warm personality and her great talent. She was 48 years old at the time of her death. I think that death hurt me more than any death that I have ever had in my family. And it still has a sting after all of these years. Probably if 
she had been buried here and I had been able to say a proper goodbye, I could have got over it a little better. But I have never really got over her death. What do you think would be a fitting epitaph for Ms. Lenora Lafayette, a great talent who died relatively young and never really gave us the greatness of her talent on these shores? In the love duet from Butterfly, when she has given up the Shinto religion in order to marry Pinkerton, she looks at him and she says, Son rinegata e felice. I'm rejected, but happy. And later in that duet, she looks at Pinkerton and she says two simple words, son contenta, I'm content. Well, that's it for this week's program, and it's time again for the Friends of LPB Membership Drive, so we'll be off the air for the next three Sundays. Please don't forget to renew your membership in Friends of LPB, and if you're not already a member, this is a good time to become one. It's a way to support the programming that you appreciate. We'll see you in a few weeks with a brand new edition of Folks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance.